So I'm here with Simon Muta, CEO of Telecom. Um, and in this final part, we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the regulatory environment and aspects of the law. A good place I'd like to start, I think, is which is a very controversial issue at the moment, is the GCSB bill and the telecommunication intercept bill. Um, in all the ruckus over the GCSB bill, the, 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 te the telecommunications bill has sort of gone a little bit under the radar and perhaps missed some of the attention that it deserves. But what's Telecom's position? I mean, you, you made a submission to the, to the select committee on, on the bill. Look, our position broadly is that a government in a nation has a right to set whatever level of standards of security monitoring it chooses, and that, you know, that's a consultation between the government and the community, and they'll pass their laws. Uh, what all that we're really asking is, is that, you know, impose on us uh, the requirements that are economically and technically viable. Don't ask us to do things that are possible and some things are very difficult to do in an internet world where we don't control many things and some things are wildly expensive to do so they sound like a good idea but it would effectively massively increase the cost to consumers of the service if we were. So let's let's keep it in perspective around what is doable and affordable is sort of one thing. And then second, level playing field please. We 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 uh, we're in a world where uh, many of the services we provide can be provided by weightless global businesses. Uh, we want this, we want everyone treated the same way. We are required to meet certain standards, so should anyone else who operates in this in this market. And there's a little bit of old thinking there that somehow telcos are different from IT companies. We're not. It's all IT today, and. Uh, you know, if you want if you want interceptability on a phone call, uh, that's fine. We'll give it to you at home, but you better get it from Skype as well because Skype's just a different means of having a voice conversation. So, so let's let's have a level playing field in the process. Um, and indeed, you could imagine an entire I mean, an entire encrypted VPN phone VoIP system, which which is yeah. which. How, how are you supposed to provide access to it? We can't, we can't unencrypt encrypted material <laughs> yeah. any more than you yeah. know any more than the government can. So don't uh, don't write a law that says we have because you know that's where I'm getting it. Don't tell it. Don't write law that requires us to try to do the technically impossible. That's pointless. Um, and uh, and yeah, and, and write laws that are practical and, and add sensible costs. Could we store every phone call and every email and every text for five years? Yes, we could. The cost of it would be unbelievable. So, you know, don't pass a law that asks us to do that sort of silly thing. So, I mean, this, this, that, that brings us to the question of privacy. And, I mean, an analogy of that might be around your house. I mean, this is the, I mean, Entick and Carrington, which is the, the ultimate law office, which sort of defines the king's right to enter your house. I don't have to give the police access to my garage. Why should I give access to to interception services to my data streams or to my data storage um, in the cloud? Is there something that, I mean, obviously it's a controversial issue. Oh, I think you, you, you've got two issues there. Is, is, is we, what we're required to do is provide the practical capability for that interception to occur. Mm. Uh, at no point, uh, that, that still requires the police or the security body to get the permissions to apply it mm. to you as a citizen. So that's a separate matter there. Yeah. What allows them to then be permitted at any point in time to use that capability, the, as it works for us as the providers of services, mm. we just require to build the capability for it to be done when a, when a judge says or a warrant is provided or or those various parties are operating within the legal, legal mandate. Now, I'm I'm a citizen. I have a view on that. I'm not prepared to share it because it's just my personal yeah. view. We're not really arguing the social issues. You know, that's that's you know the government has a consultation underway around what is right and wrong about people's rights. Mm. To be we're we're focused on the technical issues around what is a 
able to be done in the legal playing field. So one of, one of the consequences of, of, of the prison revelations is that we now know that cloud storage based in the States is not really quite at all as far as Muslim citizens are concerned. We have no protection under the law whatsoever. Um, that seems to create potentially an opportunity for some degree of more private cloud-based services locally. Do you, do you see that that's something that might come out of this? Look, I think we, we would look at all of these global... I, I think most you find most customers who use global applications are not really aware of the rights they're giving away. Even a Facebook user, mm. most of them don't realise that they, when they tick their box, agree to the terms that they're making all the content they post there belongs to Facebook, not yeah. them anymore. They, mm. so, so I think global applications and services are always going to have hooks with them and unintended consequences. So it does create an opportunity for New Zealand companies to put something into the New Zealand market that is meets the different standards. The trick with that is it can be very difficult to communicate to customers what those benefits might be or have them engage at a point at a buying decision saying, well I'll take that, not that, because it might be safer or whatever. It's not that's not the easiest thing to market it really below the below the radar sort of level. So it creates opportunities but they're not the they're not easiest in the world to market. Even, even you know, m most business customers for example would happily buy, you know, storage cloud services from, until the day something goes wrong or they find that information stolen we the first time they go, oh actually maybe I would be better with a trusted one yeah. I know or something like that. You know, so and the cost yeah. of doing that could be much, much higher. Yeah. I mean, and, and at the moment, Absolutely. the general public are getting Facebook and these world-class, these world -class fantastic services for free. So. Yeah. And you don't really know what's being done with your information and data. And I, you know, Google will be the same. I don't think most people know what Google do with all of the information about them. But they, you know, their preferences and things they do. Moving to um, UFB, do you have any view on, I mean, the government's announced a review now of I mean, they, they want to relook at it a little bit in a holistic fashion. Do you have a view on what ought to be done to get the UFB process working a little bit more sweeping? Look, our view is get to certainty quickly. It, it, you know, we're all, it's, it's almost what the answer is is secondary to the fact that give us something that we can all make bets on. We're betting billions of dollars, not just telecom, but a number of players, be it chorus, LFCs, Retailers trying to mark, we are betting billions of dollars a year trying to do this, and, and the number one issue is a moving feast. You know. So certainty is everything, and I, I think our minister gets that. And I was encouraged by you know the central purpose of the intervention was to attempt to get to certainty quickly. My problem is I'm you know I'm always a little bit sceptical of any government or commission lead process get to certain equipment, they tend to take a long time. So mm. so for me that's the, the central issue. What the exact price points of copper versus fiber, I, mean, I think there's flex in that system. And, and businesses can move and adapt once the rules are clear, you can change you, you can adjust. So it's it's less there's less absolutely a right answer mm. and there's a range of possible answers. But the central thing is Say, can we put it a line in the scene and we'll get on with yeah. some confidence and deliver the market? So, then the government sort of said that it's you know, doing a TSO review at the same time and that it almost has a holistic view that the two things should be considered to some degree together, even though they're not actually doing them together. I mean, that seems like a sensible approach in principle because they do impact on one another. Yeah. Look, we, we are very big supporters, and I think you'll find all the industry players are very to run the TSO review. It is an outdated, it's a 20 year old idea mm. born out of the Kiwi share, really in, entrenching the principles of copper network availability for voice calling uh, in some old dial up internet type mm. concept that was added to it a few years later. Strange ways of thinking about it as a single technology answer. It's a, it's high time for New Zealand to move to a future view of, of you know, call it universal.
service or service obligations, whatever they might be, uh, you'll find everyone agrees with the need to do that review, um, and we're all going to constructively engage in that. I think we'll it's probably little... find most of the industry agrees on. You know, I don't think there'll be a terrible uh, amount of, of, of misalignment. Actually, we'll yeah. have a similar view that the it. It's sort of the wider everything else review. We'd say, look, the central issue is this pricing of copper. The, U the UBA versus the fiber issue. That is the single issue that is affecting most of our decision making today. The bets we're making, the billions we're spending. Can we fix that first and then get on to the other? So can you explain a little bit clearer? I mean, the UBA versus the fiber. Well, this the, the fiber connection this, well, the issue that sparked uh, and, and caused the sort of advancement of the large review was the decision, the, the Commerce Commission's, you know, preliminary finding that the price of the unbundled bitstream service on copper for broadband should reduce, which which raised fears that it would slow down fiber uptake or weaken. You know, either you know, some people were concerned that it would slow their uptake of, of the USB fiber network. Uh, other parties were concerned that it might uh, stress Chorus's uh, financial situation to the extent that we wouldn't be able to honour its uh, contract. So they are, those are the two drivers for, for the minister saying, "Well, we need to do something to get an answer that works." Uh, understand that that is the central issue now because it is. We're all, every party in the business now needs that landed so we know what we're doing. That, I mean, that, that landline related revenue stream is quite important to telecom too. Um, I mean, you guys get part of that as well in terms of, in terms of the switching and, and part of it. How long do you see that remaining a, an important revenue stream for telecom? I mean, does it? I mean, it depends a lot what happens here, but I mean, is there a... We don't really think, the landline, you know, we think of broadband as the new access product, actually. So mm -hmm. the landline, yeah, all our marketing effort, all our focus on the future, all our innovation is centred around broadband. Mm -hmm. uh, so where it's a fixed service, it's broadband. We're not thinking about landline calling anymore. That's a, that's a dying revenue stream all around the world. Mm -hmm. and, and with it, 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 you know, landline calling has fallen away at, in round numbers, ten percent a year right. in New Zealand, just like it is everywhere else in the world. So we know we're fine with it. We're not trying to but change you see that. It, sort of five, or seven, seven or eight years. It's, it's, it's gone. you know, for for a large portion of New Zealand households, the landline is only there for broadband already. Really, they yeah. might make a few local calls, but there's a lot of households making no pay for calls at all. And, and that's normal. And, and I was just reading last night in some, um, some material in the US, 36% of households don't have a landline. In New Zealand, it's less than 10%. But in the USA, it's already 36% have no landline. Mm. In Canada, it's 16%. You know, so, mm. so it's over 20%, sorry. Uh, Australia, it's 16 yeah. They So we'll follow those trends. Free local calling has made it Slower. That's why it's yeah. that substitution is lower. That's most around the world. Local calling is a paid for service, so it's a bit of an illusion. Though. Yeah, it still costs you fifty dollars a month. It does. That's <laughs> the point, right? But but if you need the broadband line, then it's all a bit incidental. Yeah. So it only really applies if you're calling only. Mm. So if you want to fix broadband connection, so that's where the action is. So that's how we think about it. Really, we're not we're not trying to defend yeah. landline calling. It is what it is. We're just following the trends. So if you were sitting here talking to Amy Adams and, and Stephen Joyce, what would you say to them right now? I'd say, I'd just say, look, can we just have, can we move, we understand the need for these processes underway on, on you know, be it security regulation or the economic regulation around fibre and copper. How can we assist you get to certainty the most quickly? Uh, we're flexible. We're not, we're not, def we're not, we don't see there's only single answer to this. We're, we're, we're willing to engage in the range of possible outcomes. But can we do it fast, please, yeah. and get to an answer that we can all depend on? Because we're going to we're making bets 
they, 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 they are beats that are taken for years and the, the worst thing that can happen is a sense that we make a bed based on that uh, and then some, you know, someone moves the goalposts halfway through again. Um, as the internet's all pervasiveness increases, um, new sectors of the economy are facing, are facing challenges from, from other aspects of what the internet's doing. So tax in particular has become quite a big issue for a lot of businesses. Um, in many cases these issues are coming into frame in a manner which can only be addressed by multinational coordination, it would seem, and decision making. And I mean you've recently raised the fact that Apple has five hundred and seventy one million dollars in revenue in New Zealand and yet only pays two million dollars in tax. There's weightless international businesses and then they're actually they shouldn't be a weightless international business because they're actually a product seller, but they still manage to achieve achieve um, weightlessness. I mean, this on its face seems to be outrageous, but who is New Zealand to sort of challenge, challenge Apple's position in this? And I mean, how, how, can we, how can we realistically start addressing those sorts of challenges? Look, I, I think it's true that, in, you know, the OECD and the likes of need to solve some of the international tax treaty issues. And, mm. you know, you, you do want to run with what is becoming a global, you know, well, you, you'd want some standardisation to be consistent with the rest of the world. Well, there's no question in my mind about that, and I'm not, you know, I'm a do I know anything about tax law? No. <laughs> Can I make any difference to it? No. What, what strikes me as odd is why we point to some of these massive changes and point out, you know, if, if, it's, if I'm a high street retailer and I'm saying, I can't compete with Amazon because they pay no GST. I don't get why we couldn't uh, require it. It's all data. We know exactly whose credit card paid for it, whether it was bought in New Zealand or not. I mean, I don't buy it mm -hmm. that it's impossible for GST to be charged on on a you know on a purchase from Amazon website or anything else. I just I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Yeah, this is an all-data world that they're online businesses. They've got the data, they know who bought it, and what country, and what, what tax law should apply. So I think there's more doable within the current law and, and should be moved on, and, uh, and I support the programs around internationalising. And I think centrally, you know, I get that global corporations don't pay tax in every jurisdiction on the planet. And that's been the case for a hundred years, and so it wouldn't matter if you're, you know, a, a global company that sells cars or build, makes aluminium in New Zealand. Or you know, there are there are thousands of global companies operating in that country. The difference between weightless business and bricks and mortar business is they leave most of the every dollar they earn in New Zealand, they pay wages, they pay landlords, they buy materials mm. from suppliers, they buy electricity. You know, a few, a large slice of every dollar earned At finds least, its know, way back. Some economic Absolutely. Yeah. So there's, there's the, a weightless business, and Google really is the optimal. You know, really the ultimate of those uh, leaves nothing. It leaves nothing behind. It's got yeah, a few staff, staff in, a, <laughs> in a room somewhere in Auckland, right? Who paid a commission, and uh, you know that's a very different. Uh, it's a very different scenario, and so that needs to be dealt with because they have competitive advantage, and that's something no one really envisaged in the past. You know, when you have these global corporations, so it's just let's not put our heads in the sand. And we are a small company, so we have to watch out on these tax issues. This is the big countries sort of out between themselves, and they leave a little they leave out. us out. Yeah, it's, exactly. You know, and so you know, you can, and you know, I've seen you know France pushing back at, uh, at Google at the moment, and France is a big country, and they may have some clout, so they might get an answer if we don't. So I, I just think it's something to be alert to. It's early days, but let's not bury our heads in the sand. These are big.